class, and welcome to the second module in the book of Acts. I trust and pray you're all doing well. I know we're not in person together, but we plan to record these lectures week by week and follow your involvement and progress. Uh, please reach out anytime through Canvas or directly with questions you may have about the class, and I'd love to answer your Bible questions, as this is why I'm committed to this term. So go ahead, raise your hand on a text or message, and I'll get right back to you. You'll notice several attachments in this module. An article is there to help with your discussion, and a message from Dr. John R. Rice is available for your reflection paper due at the end of this term. In this lecture, we're covering Acts chapter 2. Let's jump right in to Acts 2 and begin with Roman numeral number 1 on the day of Pentecost. So lecture 3, Acts 2. Let's look here in the Word of God. The Bible says in Acts chapter 2, verse 1, And when the day of Pentecost was fully come. So let's start here with the day of Pentecost. Uh, this word for Pentecost is an adjective, Pentecoste, uh, denoting 50th. Uh, used as a noun with day, it indicates the 50th day following Passover. Pentecost is a celebration of the beginning of harvest and the anticipation of a much larger crop. Although Luke does not explain it here, it's easy to see how this rep represents the completion of the first harvest of souls. We're going to see 3,000 saved in a single day, of which there will be many more throughout the church age. John Phillips, in your textbook, goes into a great detail about the Feast of, of Pentecost and how on that day they would take grains of corn and grind them into flour, adding oil and leaven to make two loaves of bread. The loaves were then offered to the Lord with ten sacrifices pointing to the perfection of Christ. Pentecost always fell on the first day of the week, symbolizing the end of the Sabbath and the consecration of the Lord's Day in a new dispensation. Did you know that Pentecost occurred on the same day as the law was given on Sinai? So the law was given in the Old Testament and now the Spirit. The oil in the loaves typified the work of the Holy Spirit and leaven was included to let us know that we're still imperfect, but it's the Spirit that's in us that is making us more like Jesus. The fact that two loaves were used that day are equally significant. We'll see here and later in Acts how there would be others that would be saved and come into the family, uh, that neither Jew nor Gentile, but now we're one in Christ. The day was, a, letter A, a fulfillment of the promise of the Holy Spirit. The Spirit came, not as He had done in the Old Testament times, selectively upon individuals in a limited sense, like He did in Judges 14, chapter 19, or Judges 14, and then 16 as well. In 1 Samuel 10 and 16, we see the Spirit coming upon individuals. But now, He would not only simply come upon, but be within as a permanent, outflowing, overflowing presence. On Pentecost, the Lord Jesus Christ immersed, baptized His church, and all believers from that moment on are baptized in the Holy Ghost. John Phillips put it this way, The day of Pentecost had come 1,500 times before, but now it was fully come. Look, look at the verse. Now the day of Pentecost was fully come. It had come and gone, come and gone ever since Moses instituted the feast. Now it had come to stay. Oh, Pentecost is something that's here as we rejoice in the gift of the Holy Spirit. Here to stay. Every believer is baptized and indwelt with the Holy Spirit at the moment of salvation. We see that in 1 Corinthians 6, 19 and Romans 8, verse 9. The Holy Spirit. So let's look at the, the sign here. We see the sign of the Holy Spirit in, in letter, letter B. The Word of God says in verse number 2 that while they're in one accord, suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled all the house where they were, they were sitting. And there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as a fire, and sat upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost as the Spirit gave them utterance. God the Father signified the coming of God the Son with, an angels, with angels and with a star. With the coming of God the Holy Spirit, He signified the event with wind and fire. Why a rushing mighty wind? I think about how the Lord spoke to Job through a whirlwind. I think of the Lord Jesus in Jerusalem with Nicodemus in John 3 when he likened the movement of the Spirit to the wind. The Hebrew and Greek words for wind are the same words for spirit. There was a miracle of sound. There was also a miracle of sight. And uh, 
as we're looking at uh, what the, God the Father did, signifying that with wind and with fire. So a miracle of sound, a miracle of, of sight, as cloven tongues appeared unto them as a fire, and it sat upon each of them. Why fire? Hebrews 12, 29, for our God is a consuming fire. Remember Moses in the Old Testament, he saw the bush and it burned not, but it was a, it was a, it was a, bu a bush that was burning, known as a burning bush, but it was not consumed. God descended on Sinai with fire and with smoke. The wind was what opened up the Red Sea. A pillar of fire led them by night in the wilderness. The same God manifesting the same attributes of wind and fire. The miracle of sound, a miracle of sight, and there in your notes, the miracle of speech. And here's where a lot of confusion is. They began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave utterance. They spoke in other languages, again, manifesting that omniscience of God, a God who knows all languages, who knows all men. What's the purpose of Pentecost? Letter A, to be filled with the Holy Spirit. To be filled with the Holy Spirit is to be controlled entirely by the Spirit of God. That means our lives are free from unconfessed sin, that we do not regard iniquity in our hearts. I want you to get this statement. Being filled with the Spirit is the duty and privilege of every believer. Ephesians 5, 18. And be not drunk with wine, wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit. The only requirements for being filled with the Spirit are a clean vessel. We're not to grieve or quench the Spirit. We're not to do anything that would displease God or fail to do something that would please Him. We have a clean vessel. We're to ask for the filling. And when we ask, we must appropriate that filling for the purpose to experience that power. I like to illustrate how the filling of the Spirit is much like fuel in a car. And if you're driving a vehicle, if a vehicle was designed for the purpose to operate under uh, the filling of fuel. And just like a Christian, we're designed by God to operate under the filling of the Holy Spirit. And then when we are empowered, we're, we're winning souls for Jesus Christ. Verse 4 says, And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost, began to speak with other, with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. But look at what happened here as they spoke in tongues. Verse 5, and they were dwelling in Jerusalem, Jews, devout men, out of every nation under heaven. Now when this was noised abroad, the multitude came together and were confounded because that every man heard them speak in his own language. And they were all amazed and marveled, saying one to another, Behold, are not all these which speak Galileans? How hear we every man in our own, our own tongue wherein we were born? Parthenians, Medes, Elamites, the dwellers of Mesopotamia, and Judea, and Cappadocia, and Pontus, and Asia, Phrygia, Pamphylia, Egypt, and the parts of Libya around Cyrene, and strangers of Rome, Jews and proselytes, Cretes and Arabians, we do hear them speak in our tongues the wonderful works of God. Pentecost was the opportune time to preach the gospel to these people groups. Jerusalem had many visitors for the festival. The Jewish men were required to attend. Sixteen nationalities and languages are listed here. Galileans were known as uneducated, uncouth, country bumpkins, so to speak. They had an accent that betrayed them. Remember what they said to Peter at the fire, thy speech betrayeth thee, you're a Galilean. Historians said those from Galilee had trouble uttering the guttural sound, and so they kind of swallow their words. That's kind of what they, what they were. And they would be the last people in the world you would ever imagine to fluently speak in other languages. Everyone was amazed. Not only were they speaking in other languages, they were speaking in direct dialects of people who have come to the Feast of Pentecost. These dialects and languages are listed. Jewish people from all over the known world. And some of the places listed are a three-day journey at least, if not more, a week journey to Jerusalem. So people from far away, those that are going are wondering how in the world do these Galileans, how can they speak our language and even dialect? On Pentecost, the Spirit of God filled ordinary people. And ordinary people were doing extraordinary things. And they were talking about how good God is. That's Pentecost. So let's cover this because this comes up. What is speaking in tongues? My family 
came out of the charismatic movement. And it was the faithful teaching and preaching of men like Dr. John R. Rice who immensely helped them. There are good people who are confused on this issue. The charismatic movement is the fastest growing cult in Christianity today. Many Christians are confused on the topic of speaking in tongues. So let's take some time. You can look at your notes. There's a discussion question. Excursus on tongues. Let's look at just a few things here, and we'll go brief through this. The word tongues, number one, means languages. Verses 9 through 11 indicates known dialects and languages. When they reference a static utterance, they are drawing from pagan literature. Glossa nearly always is used to refer to language. Dialectos in Acts 2 is the first instance and sets the standard for the rest of the use there in Acts. Each time it's used is in a plural form. Number two, a definition of the gift of tongues. Here's a good definition. The supernatural ability to speak in a, lone, in a, in a known language that was not previously known. And speaking in another language was never the initial evidence of being filled with the Spirit. Number three. 1 Corinthians 12, 30, and I have taken people to this passage and show them, do all speak with tongues and, and assumed no. Number four, the miracle of being able to speak another language without the formal training was assigned to unbelieving Jews. We have one purpose that's given for tongues. It's found in 1 Corinthians 14, verse 22. Uh, tongues are not for those that believe, those that believe not, specifically unbelieving Jews. Acts 28, the Assyrians are speaking, and this is the reference from Isaiah rather 28, and they're speaking in Assyrian as a sign of judgment against the Jewish people. Genesis 11 is the only other miracle in the Bible dealing with languages, and they're dealing with actual languages. People were amazed, and the language groups were listed of those who heard in their own tongue. Number five, tongues would serve as a sign of authentication. The tongues and acts authenticated the message of the apostles, the coming of the Holy Spirit, the inauguration of the church age. They are a sign, and they're a sign to those who are unbelieving. Tongues was a sign of judgment there to Israel, as we mentioned. Acts is a book of transition. We have a transition in how God is working. He was working through Israel. Now he's going to be working through a new entity, namely the church. Why is this transition necessary? The reason there is a shift in God's program is because Israel rejected her Messiah based on the rejection of the Jewish people of of Jesus, the Jewish nation of Israel, in Luke 21, Jesus makes it very clear that because of Israel's rejection of the Messiah, Jerusalem would be trotted down by the Gentiles. He told them they were more wicked than their forefathers. He pronounced judgment upon them, saying that their house would be left desolate. The judgment did come in AD 70 on Jerusalem. Tongues were a sign for unbelieving Israel that judgment was coming. Tongues were meant to the generation of Jews that killed Jesus as a son of judgment. That generation was judged, and therefore tongues have served their purpose, primarily there in Acts. It's clear that speaking in tongues and the working of authenticating miracles gradually decreased as the New Testament scriptures were completed. You can go through Acts and go through epistles and see that in their authority, the scripture's authority was established. Hebrews 2.4 is a great passage that talks about the workings and signs of the apostle. And since we know the office of an apostle has ceased, and scripture is completed, the authenticating sign gifts are also not in operation as they were in the book of Acts. Number seven, modern tongues don't resemble biblical tongues. What's being called tongues today is not following the instructions in order of 1 Corinthians 13 and 14. In the modern tongues movement, people are taught how to speak in tongues. My parents attended a church where they would take people in the back room and say, here's how to do it, ta, 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 ti, 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 and they would teach these things. Well, in the Bible, biblical tongues, people had an immediate ability to speak in another language that they previously didn't know. How do we explain what happens is happening today? Well, in, in some circles where they're advocated, you're, you're taught to do certain things, make certain sounds. Much of what is claimed to be spoken in tongues is, is not even done in public in a sense of the way 1 Corinthians 14 lays out. There's no way to validate what's happening. Also, we can't rule out the demonic, psychological, or hypnotic. What about 1 Corinthians 13, 1, speaking in the tongues of angels? Well, every time you see angels speaking in the Bible, they're speaking in known tongues, in known languages. The question is hypothetical in 1 Corinthians 13. It's a passage about charity, and it's using that as a hypothetical. What about Mark 16, 17? They shall speak in new tongues. Well, Mark 16, 17 is not prescriptive. It's predictive. 
and must be seen with the other areas also predicted. They'll take up serpents and not be touched and suffer harm. That was obviously prophetic and predicted. Uh, John Phillips had a, a great statement about tongues. He said the gift of tongues was not intended to make the disciples feel good, superior or personally edified. It was intended to make them a powerful witness it was a supernatural gift designed to arrest the attention of the Jewish people and rivet their attention on the gospel. So uh, if I were in class here, I would have thought about, you know, bring it some sort of sign or some kind of show to get your attention. If I get your attention, you're, you're listening up. And that's the same thing that they happened there in the book of Acts. You'll notice our discussion question. I want you to be involved in that. And and think of answers and how to communicate this area effectively. There's supplemental material for you to look at and consider. I recommend that book by Dr. John R. Rice and The Power of Pentecost. I'll share this as we close this excursus. My mother struggled with this area until my sister, as a little girl, didn't know what she was saying. So she said, Mom, why are you making these weird sounds? And, she's, and my mother said, Well, I don't, I don't know what I'm saying. Only God knows. My sister, as a little girl, said, he thought about it for a while and said, why would God want you to say something you don't understand? Would you want me to talk to you and not know what I'm saying? That was the last day my mom spoke in tongues. My dad could never figure it or fake it out, so he always thought something was a little weird with it. But the sound, the sight, and speech were all incidental parts of Pentecost. Nobody's looking for cloven tongues to appear. Nobody's wanting the wind to come through. But for some reason, their attention is placed upon that tongues. Miracles were always a sign to get people's attention. The Jews require a sign, and the message is what's important. Here, Peter is preaching the message. It's a defense. It's a declaration. It calls for a decision. What does Peter do? He goes right to the Bible. He goes to the Old Testament books of, of, of Joel and Psalms. He's, Joel 2.28 is referenced in Psalm 16, 8 through 11. It proves that this day of Pentecost was in prophecy. He proves that Jesus was who he claimed to be. He preaches, and here's his message in short, he preaches what happened. The Spirit had come. How it happened. Jesus was alive. Why it happened. To save sinners. Peter doesn't say we're the answer. He doesn't say, hey, come join our upper room ministry and learn how to speak in tongues and maybe you'll make it to an apostle one day. No, he says you need Jesus. He proved himself through wonders. He proved himself through the word. He proved himself through witnesses. Verse 41 says, and they that gladly received his word were baptized. And the same day there were added unto them about 3,000 souls. Wow, 3,000 souls were saved. That's the point. Power to see people saved. Verse 142, and they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship and breaking of bread and in prayers. And that's another proof as well. Apostles' doctrine that we are in steadfastly today is the word of God. That's where the office is found. And fellowship and it says in the prayers and fear came upon every soul and many wonders and signs were done by who? The apostles, not those that are newly saved, but the apostles were doing these signs. Verse 44, and all that believed were together and had all things common and sold their possessions and goods and parted them to all men as every man has had need. And they continuing daily with one accord in the temple, breaking bread from house to house, did eat their meat with gladness and singleness of heart praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to the church daily as such as should be saved. Here's what happened in the early church. This is the power of Pentecost. Evangelization took place. The very baseline and beginning of ministry must be sharing the gospel. I want you to get that. See that in your notes. Sharing the gospel is primary. Edification was happening. The leaders of the church of Jerusalem were involved in teaching basic Bible doctrine. Exhortation occurred. Exhortation is being near someone. They spent time with someone. A good shepherd smells like sheep. You know, Paul Chapel has this tremendous statement. Dr. Chapel says, now you can impress someone from a distance, but you can only influence them up close. Do you want to see the power of Pentecost? Here's the power of Pentecost. It was not, it is not the wind. It was not, it is not the fire. It was not, is not speaking in tongues. It was and is the evidence of changed lives by the power of God. Hey, as you're looking at this, this subject, there are many people that have a lot of thoughts on it. But let me encourage you to go to the Bible. Look at what God's Word says. We've seen the power 
Now we're going to see it further applied in the name of Jesus. Join me in Lecture 4.